Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Welcome, my friend, to the podcast where we take joy in the discovery of your family's history. This is Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 226. And in today's show, we will cover research strategies and some new resources that are going to help you find your way. Plus, got a tech tip for you and a fascinating bit of military history and genealogy for you. There are so many things I want to cover every month, but I try really, really hard to sift through all of it for you and kind of just bring you the best of the best, which of course is what we call the genealogy gems. And I love when you bring me gems just like Betty did recently. Now, Betty is taking my online course over at Family Tree University this month. It's called Google Earth for Genealogy. I told you all about that in uh, my weekly newsletter. I do hope you are signed up for that, right? Uh, You can do that on our homepage at genealogygems.com. Well, Betty was so excited about something that she had found that she wrote the following on the discussion board over in the course. And she says, This is totally off the subject of this class, but it goes along with the podcast I just listened to about discovering your great-grandfather in a remastered home movie. Do you remember me talking about that? I I was so amazed because I hadn't noticed him before in these old home movies until I got them restored. and, And there he was. She said, I can't remember the number of the podcast. Otherwise, I would have replied to it there. Let me tell you all what the podcast number was. Now, the way I do this is I go to genealogygems.com, go up to podcast in the menu, click on Genealogy Gems podcast. And that episode, well, we talked to David Haas in 223, and it was in 224, where I told you about finding my great grandfather in this old home movie. And then we talked more about how to work with your home movies, how to, you know, get busy on YouTube, all that kind of good stuff. Well, Betty says, my husband and I just saw the movie, They Shall Not Grow Old, about the soldiers in World War I. We saw it in 3D, which was amazing. The whole movie is remastered, colorized video and audio from the newsreels, and also the soldiers' interviews in the 1960s and 70s. The director, Peter Jackson, introduces the movie, and then the best part is after the show. Peter Jackson talks for half an hour about the making of the movie and why he did it. His grandfather fought in World War I, and he's always been interested in the history of that war. He tells everyone to find out about their family members who fought in World War I by interviewing their grandparents' generation. He encourages people to find out the history of their family. Wow, I couldn't wait to tell you. I don't know if the theaters will run the documentary for very long, so I hope you can see it before it leaves the theaters. I hope they keep running the last half hour. So when I saw Betty's message, it was about 8 p.m. that night on the Google Earth for Genealogy forum, and I immediately grabbed Bill and we jumped in the car for the 9.30 p.m. showing. (laughs) I did not waste any time, okay? Uh, Now, again, this is called They Shall Not Grow Old, and I couldn't agree more with Betty, that it was spectacular. And I think as an audio and video producer, my favorite part as well was that last half hour with Peter Jackson. Uh, He really takes you through the process of how they selected the approach for the movie. They were actually approached by an archives who has all this footage to kind of recognize the 100 year anniversary of World War One. And so he went to through like 600 hours of video, and it was just a huge project. And what he ended up doing was deciding to make the documentary movie only footage. So no host, no presenters, no, you know, modern day filming. It was all old footage and images. And of course, these old interviews that were done on audio are kind of interspliced through all of it. It was amazing. And, And the cherry on the top, of course, was the fact that he colorized and restored these images. Now you can imagine with old movies like this, we're talking about, you know, the 1915, 1917, 1918 era, you're talking about film that has been getting older and older and older, and it shrinks, and it warps. And the problem they have is that the little sprocket holes along the sides of the film, you've seen that, 
that doesn't fit properly anymore on the equipment. And that's what causes all that jerkiness. And it looks like they're going too fast. And of course, the going too fast is about how many frames per second that they are filming at because they're hand cranking, right? They're hand cranking the camera. So there's a lot of factors that go into why it kind of looks so unreal, besides the fact that it's degrading, and it's black and white and the whole thing. Well, They have some amazing technology that they develop in-house in Peter Jackson's um, production studio, and they corrected this film to just amazing degrees and brought it into color, which, as he says in the film, really brings home, hey, these are real people. You know, it's so easy to look at black and white photos and film and think of these as kind of this other time, it's this unreal kind of place. But these are real people with color clothing, you know, and they are wearing vivid colors and not vivid colors. And they're walking around in green grassy knolls. And you know, so it really brings it to life. And it makes it so much more relatable. I think it's a good way to put it. So anyway, he talks about in this last half hour, how he made the film, what the different pieces were and going to really make it authentic. And that deep down his hope was that it would inspire other people to look into their own family history, and particularly their military history and World War One's connection to their family, which all of us have some sort of connection to World War One. All of us have ancestors who lived through it, even if they didn't serve in some way, their lives were affected by World War One. And it's just tremendous. And And it turns out that uh, Peter Jackson, of course, you may know that name from the Lord of the Rings trilogies and the amazing films that he has done outside of this documentary. He is an avid collector and historian on World War I and has a huge museum down in New Zealand where he works. So phenomenal stuff. I mean, I could just talk about it all day. And I, I felt like it was such a treat to get that half an hour at the end of that documentary, just to get the behind the scenes and really kind of hear his heart where he was coming from in producing this film. Anyway, so (laughs) um, Betty was thrilled. And I, and of course, I went back on the forum and I told her, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, we were in the car, we were down there watching this film. And I can't wait to talk more about and explore because it really fits into what we've been talking about here on the podcast, doesn't it? About old films and uh, our family's role in history and, and the whole thing and restoring all that. Well, Betty followed up to the message forum discussion by emailing me directly, which of course, you can do too. You can do it at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. So she says, I was so excited about it that I had to tell you, and I didn't know how to do it quickly, except by posting on the Family Tree University class discussion page. When I read that you went straight to the movie, I almost cried. I was so happy. I knew you would like the last half hour the best. She says, when Peter Jackson talked about everyone finding out about the history of their family, I was so excited. Wasn't it amazing what they could do with old video, still shots, cartoons, and audio interviews? It has so much potential for genealogists. Whew. That's, uh, that's a statement we can all agree with. She says, the important thing is to gather the information and digitize the videos we already have, which of course we've been preaching here on the show She says, in the future, maybe the technology will be more accessible to us, non-professional family historians. I think she's talking about that restoration software. Peter said that they developed that right in-house, which is pretty phenomenal, which I can imagine you'd have to do to do some of the projects he does. Um, But we're seeing every day there's new apps, there's new software, things coming out that can just do more and more and more with our still photos and, of course, our video. And I've told you about Uh, Larson Digital out in Utah, and video conversion experts out in Arizona. Wow, they have some really high level professional restoration time equipment. And that was what I had done to my old eight millimeter films. And it, it, it wasn't as good as this movie, but it was darn good. She says, what a treasure that movie was. I hope it inspires more people to do the same with other aspects of World War One, or other historical subjects. Well, What a fun way to to kick off this episode, right in the sweet spot of what we've been talking about here on the show. I hope you continue to be inspired to, to really take the steps to further ask the questions, talk to your older living relatives, get the old films out, get the photos out, get things digitized so they're preserved, get them restored. Wow, what a legacy. Each one of us has the opportunity to leave. It's just phenomenal. So... 
Don't miss it. Run out tonight to go see the movie. It's called They Shall Not Grow Old. And it is a documentary style film. In my theater, they had it 3D and standard. I will have a link in the show notes because there are some really wonderful trailer videos that you can kind of get a feel for it that are on YouTube. So I'll have those right there in the show notes for this episode, number 226. Well, now, since it's February, of course, we're all thinking about Valentine's Day. And that, of course, gets you thinking about hearts and Cupid. And of course, Cupid was a little unclothed baby with an arrow that could strike love in the hearts of unsuspecting folks. We all love babies. And our ancestors were all once babies. So, of course, when Allison Singleton, librarian over at Allen County Library's Genealogy Center, told me that there was a fascinating history behind the clothing of our little cherub ancestors, I had to invite her on the show. How's that for a long way around segue? So, without further ado, let's hear from Allison Dupre Singleton about the history of our ancestors and their baby clothes. This is Allison Dupre Singleton, Genealogy Library at the Allen County Public Library Genealogy Center, and I have a little Valentine's Day gem for you. What better way to celebrate February than to speak about babies? Cupid is often shown as a baby dressed in his nappy and no other clothing. Speaking of baby clothing, how were our ancestors dressed as babies? Have you ever wondered why there are so many photographs of your female ancestors as children and not of the male ancestors? Do we have a treat for you? The history of baby clothes in America is fascinating. Many reasons exist as to why much is not written about baby clothes the further back in history you go. One reason is that baby clothes were just a natural part of life and not something that was documented thoroughly. Another is that baby clothes were not colorful or eye-catching, in other words, boring. Traditionally, baby clothes were white so they could be easily bleached. As we all know, babies are pretty messy. In the 1600s, babies were swaddled and not in the current sense of the word. They were wrapped tightly in cloth so their legs and arms would stay straight. It was thought that if the baby's limbs were bent, they could become physically deformed. The swaddling went from their head down their entire body to keep it still and straight. The children were swaddled so firmly, their heads didn't even need to be supported. How incredibly uncomfortable. Another fascinating 17th century practice is the use of stays on babies. Once a baby left the swaddling period, he or she was put into a tiny corset or stays to keep straight and stiff. The era placed a great deal of emphasis on the positivity of an erect and straight posture. Parents dressed their children in long skirts, regardless of sex, to prevent crawling, which was considered barbaric and unnatural. The long skirts were significant indicators of age and not sex. The 1700s brought new ideas about allowing physical freedom for babies. Firm swaddling went out of vogue, and so did infant stays, lucky little babies. Parents still dressed their babies in little dresses, but they were now ankle length after about six months. As the centuries went by, baby clothes became more ornate and frilly. Social norms considered babies to be beautiful, no matter the sex. No concerns existed about differentiating the gender at a glance. Boys and girls alike could have long ringlets and wear dresses. This makes identifying boys and girls in photographs more difficult. There were small nuances that separated the boys from the girls. The boys could have one style of dress, while the girls could possibly have a more ornate dress. Clothes were not distinct to gender until children reached a certain age. Boys would then be breeched, or allowed to wear breeches, or breeches, sometime between four and seven years of age. As the decades passed, the age to be breeched became younger and younger. With the advent of the washing machines in the mid-1800s and the expanded availability of store-bought fabrics, 
baby clothes began to have a bit of a hue to them. Initially, there were no colors assigned to either sex, but this changed in the mid-1800s. And originally, boys were assigned the color pink, and girls were assigned the color blue. Various articles, books, and newspaper articles show this opposite color assignment for babies, including this article from 1897. Quote, On Friday, when she read the papers and learned of the event at Princeton, Mrs. McKinley smiled. But her smile had a trace of discomfiture. The booties which she had sent Mrs. Cleveland were blue, and as all the world which has had experience in such things well knows, blue booties are for girls and pink for boys. This is from Saturday, November 6th, 1897. The mixed beliefs about the correct color for each gender continued well into the 1900s. In 1925, the Betty Bob's family paper doll book came out with a baby Bobby in it, featuring some feminine-looking clothing. The Times Magazine featured a chart on which 10 popular department stores labeled the gender of clothes for which sex. Six stores listed pink for boys, and only five stores showed pink for girls. One store even had pink for both sexes. Not until after World War II did the custom of assigning pink for girls and blue for boys become set. One thing to note is that even in today's society, baby girls can wear blue or pink, but baby boys generally are not dressed in pink. Since the color assignments became set, it has become an insult to many mothers to call a child by the wrong gender. You will see many babies with some kind of indicator on them such as a bow headband or a little blue blanket or toy, even if their clothes are not in a female shade or male shade of color. It is a relatively new phenomenon to have gender-assigned clothing instead of just age-assigned clothing. Take another look at your family photos and those vintage baby clothes. You might see something new from a new perspective. I'm Allison Dupre Singleton of the Allen County Public Library Genealogy Center, and you can visit us at genealogycenter.org. Remember running to the mailbox as a kid, excited about what might be held inside? Yep, I still feel that way today about my inbox and my voicemail box because so often I get to hear from you and I love it. Uh, I've got a couple items here to share from some of you. Mary Lovell Swetnam, uh, she's Special Collections Librarian at the Virginia Beach Public Library. She wrote me to tell me about a new online resource that she thought you would want to hear about too. She says, Dear Lisa, the Virginia Beach Public Library, where I work in the archives, has just published the following explanatory material and two charts on the library's digital archives. I thought that your readers and your listeners might benefit from the reminder to read the front material in a book in order to determine the parameters of a work. By doing so, I was able to determine that hundreds of records of enslaved persons were not included in either of the two previous abstracts of the Overwharton Parish Register. They have now been abstracted and are available for free on our website. Uh, she sent me a link, so I will have that in the show notes for you. 
And she says she's also included a copy of the explanatory material for the project. Thanks for keeping us all up to speed in the ever-changing world of genealogy. Well, it's my pleasure. And thank you so much, um, Mary Lovell, for alerting us to this, because even if this particular item isn't applicable to your genealogy, um, what she's talking about is the importance of really looking at the abstracts, getting familiar with whatever collection, whatever resource, whatever book you're going to look at, um, whatever those items are, you want to orient yourselves to them. And I think Melissa Barker, the archive lady, has talked about this as well. Um, finding guides are so essential for this. And she found that in kind of reviewing the collection, but then reviewing the abstract, wow, some important things were missing and people might miss out. So um, how awesome that the librarians and the archives across the country, across the world, are keeping their eye out like this every day and that something new can be discovered every day. I, I always get blown away by that. I think that is wonderful. And it's very heartening. Who knows? She may just spot something in the next item that we need that wasn't in the abstract. So thank you so much, Mary Lovell, for sharing. It's a good reminder. And again, I'll have links in the show notes for all that. And Dana wrote in with one purpose in mind to share her genealogy happy dance with us. And I think that's awesome. It's an awesome reason to write, isn't it? She says, I am doing the joyful genealogy dance. After not finding the baptism of my immigrant ancestor in his ancestral village of Warmer, North Holland, I did all the Family History Library Dutch tutorials, and I began scouring the countryside for his and his father's names on a neighboring church's baptismal register. This is loopy Dutch handwriting from the 1620s, and I don't know Dutch. A tall task. I knew that I sought Netherlands Hervermood denomination, which was abbreviated NH. I found a list of digital records, but the abbreviation was NG. Not being sure I was looking at the desired denomination, I took a screenshot of the top of the 1623 baptismal register and posted it on Facebook. And I think she's saying that she posted in a Dutch genealogy group or forum on Facebook. Or she may have just put Dutch genealogy in the posting. I don't know for sure. She says, within an hour, I got responses. Wonderful. A conversation ensued, culminating in a gentleman giving me a link to a digital resource, Waterland Archive. I had attempted that website a few years ago, but I'd had no luck navigating it. His link took me directly to a listing of 63 spreadsheets of vital statistics of the region I'm interested in. She's got all kinds of exclamation points. <laughs> His help saved me weeks of drudgery. I have to share my happy news with someone who would rejoice with me. Well, we are rejoicing with you, Dana. Thank you so much for writing in. So, okay, so important takeaways from Dana's joyful genealogy happy dance. One, Facebook's an amazing resource for just putting it out there. There's always somebody who can read the language, is familiar with the collection, or lives there personally and can do something for you. So it's a definitely a wonderful give and take place. If you're connecting with other genealogists or getting involved in a genealogy group, and there are tons of them, tons of them, just use the search box to find with using keywords, locations, genealogy, history, you, you'll find the groups, just like she did. So you put it out there and people, of course, will just race to be the one to be able to give you the answer, they'll be so excited. And um, it also it's a great reminder that, you know, things change, you may have looked at something a year ago, and there was nothing online. And you turn around and there's a site with 63 spreadsheets. That has literally happened to me as well. It happened to me with my great grandmother's uh, East Prussian church parish. I mean, it's unbelievable. You can't make it up and you can't plan for it. But that's a good reason, once again, my friend, to um, set up a Google alert. So if you're looking at sites, if you're looking for materials, and it's just not there right now, it could be on its way in three months. So put out a Google alert, you can learn more about it in previous podcast episodes here or in my book. And that is the way to to get Google to bring that information to you the moment it becomes available. So how awesome. If you want to email or leave me a voicemail and share your genealogy happy dance, please do. You can email me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com 
or you can leave a voicemail, 925-272-4021. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad Who knows that we are winning And I'll bet he's glad For more than any other As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. What a treat it is to have Amanda Epperson, PhD, joining us here at Genealogy Gems. Amanda is an expert on Scottish genealogy research, and she's the author of the new book, The Family Tree Scottish Genealogy Guide. Now, if you've ever suspected that you have Scottish roots, keep listening, because Amanda's about to share some of her top strategies to help you find your ancestors in Scottish records. And if you don't have Scottish roots... I think you'll still hear some techniques and uh, things to keep your eye out for in the area of the world in which you're searching. And who knows, you may end up finding a Scottish line sometime in the future. And you'll be glad you know. Here's Amanda. Hi, this is Amanda Epperson, the author of the recently published Family Tree Scottish Genealogy Guide. Today, I'm going to share with you three tips to researching your ancestors in Scottish records. If your love of tartan, bagpipes, and kilts equals your love of family history research, you are likely hoping to find an ancestor who was born in Scotland. Or perhaps nothing would surprise you more than to find a Scottish ancestor. In either case, the next step is to locate this ancestor in Scottish records. As with all immigrants, The first step to finding them in their homeland is to research their lives extensively in America before searching for them in Scottish records. Once you do that, use these three strategies to locate your ancestor in Scottish records. First, determine whether your Scottish-born ancestor arrived in the United States before or after 1855, the year statutory or civil registration began in Scotland. This year is an important divide in Scottish genealogy. Before 1855, you will need to start your research with the old parish records, commonly known as the OPR, and after 1855, you can use the statutory records. With this knowledge, you will be able to organize your research and manage expectations of the data you will find. If your ancestors came to America after 1855, then they and their relatives should be included in the statutory records. These records are extremely detailed, and each type invariably includes the name of an individual's parents. Parish records are an amazing resource, but they are not complete and were not well kept in all parishes. Consequently, many people do not appear in the OPR. Indexes for parish records are available at many websites, like FamilySearch.org. Images of these documents can be viewed at your local family history center or an affiliate library. 
Statutory records, called civil records in the FamilySearch catalog, are partially indexed at FamilySearch, and selected years are also available at your local Family History Center. Scotland's People has a complete set of OPR and statutory records available on a pay-per-view basis. Second, determine your ancestor's Scottish place of birth. The name of the parish is best, but you may be able to manage with just the county if your ancestor's name was uncommon or you know the names of several of their family members. Check available U.S. records for this information. For example, vital records, post-1906 naturalization records. Um, before this date, naturalizations usually only record the country of origin. Passenger list, county or local histories, or in correspondence. If you are really lucky, you may find your ancestor in the series of books by David Dobson, who mines both U.S. and U.K. records for emigrant Scots. Several of his books are available at Ancestry.com and are searchable. Location is a key fact because many Scots have the same name and many surnames, like Smith, Campbell, and Stewart, are quite common. Additionally, the same surname does not guarantee a family relationship, even for more uncommon names. Many passenger lists record an immigrant's last place of residence, which for Europeans was their place of birth. However, due to high rates of internal migration in Scotland, this may not be true for many Scottish immigrants. Keep an eye out for other locations associated with your ancestor. Also be sure to check if the passenger list records the name and resident of the immigrant's nearest relation in the old country. It is possible that this is your ancestor's actual place of origin. Third, determine all variations of your ancestor's first and last names, especially if your ancestor was from the Scottish Highlands. In this region, the bulk of the population spoke Scots Gaelic until the 19th century. However, all church records were kept in English, even if the minister spoke Scots Gaelic. This meant that all Gaelic's names, both first and last, needed to be rendered in English. There was often no consistency in how this was done. Some English renderings were reasonably close to the Scots Gaelic name, but others were inspired by biblical or Latin names. Two commonly interchangeable names include Donald and Daniel, and Angus and Aeneas. Highlanders also easily change surnames, especially when moving from the land of one landlord to another. These name changes are often included in parish registers as an alias, as in Macintosh alias Catanet. And when Gaelic speakers moved south, they often anglicized their surnames, so McToymish in Inverness became Thompson in Glasgow. You can learn more about interchangeable names in a brief article by Alan G. McPherson, which is available online. While finding any immigrant ancestor can be a challenge, and Scots are no different, there is the advantage that most of the records are in English, are easily available, and many of them have been indexed. Following these three basic steps will help you identify your ancestors in Scottish records. Ah, Amanda Epperson, PhD. She knows her stuff when it comes to Scottish genealogy. And she's just a darn good genealogist as well. So we can all take away kind of the methodology behind the research that she's talking about. If you want to hear more, I sure hope you are a Genealogy Gems premium member because I sat down with Amanda and dug in even deeper into Scottish research and just good general genealogical research practices as well. That is going to be coming up in our next Genealogy Gems premium episode. You don't want to miss it. And you don't want to miss the brand new video that I just published uh, in this last couple of weeks. It's called The Big Picture in little details. I think you're really going to enjoy this video. And I've got a downloadable handout that goes along with it. It's 43 minutes. It's part of your Genealogy Gems premium membership. So if you're not a member, this is a great time to become a member. We have a huge collection of really wonderful, um, high quality videos for you. But this brand new one, and we try to put one out every other month or so, uh, is one of my favorites. It's one where I'm kind of sharing with you not only detailed research strategies, but some big picture concepts that I think are so important um, that kind of pull everything together. And um, I think you'll have fun seeing some of the things that I uncover 
by digging into what looks like a very big picture item and discovering that there are lots of little detail clues that are just waiting to be found. That is in the new premium video, the big picture in little details. So premium videos, I think there are well over 50 at this point as part of premium membership, probably closer to 70, I'm guessing. And of course, premium podcasts are all part of Genealogy Gems premium membership. If you want to become a member, you head to genealogygems.com and uh, click premium in the menu. You'll see the subscribe link there. Our sponsor for this episode is MyHeritage. They have over 70 million members worldwide. Now, if you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, MyHeritage is the place that you want to be. I uploaded my family tree hoping for a breakthrough in my German family line, and that breakthrough happened really quickly. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany, and that was my first international cousin contact. And my heritage has a unique and powerful search system. It's called Record Matches. Now, this constantly calls over 8 billion historical records for your family. It's also the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. So find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. Italian attention, right, dress, front, right shoulder, arms, forward, march. Hello, listeners, we've mustered in for another episode of Military Minutes with Michael Strauss. I've been on extended leave for the last several months, but have been ordered back to active duty. The last time we met, We discussed military ephemera and the importance of diaries, letters, and journals. This month, we revisit draft registrations from both World War I and World War II. You will recall that this was the subject of our first topic together. Since then, several listeners have had questions and comments regarding the numbering system on the cards, draft classifications, and really just how to dig deeper into the records of the Selective Service System. Now, starting with World War I draft registrations, this would include all eligible men between the ages of 18 and 45. It was separated into three registrations, along with a supplemental one. Now, on the corners of each registration card were stamped or written a series of numbers. On the left was a serial number that was assigned to the men as soon as they registered. This could have also have been the registrant that was in line that day when the cards were filled out. Once done at the local boards, the headquarters office in Washington, D.C. would place each of the serial numbers into a container. Now, on July 20th of 1917, Secretary of War Newton Baker drew the first of 10,500 numbers from a bowl for the first registration. The first number drawn was number 258, for which every person who had that number was given an order number of 1. This was repeated until each serial number had a corresponding order number, the order number being on the upper right side of the card. On the back of the registration cards was stamped another series of numbers, followed by a letter designation. For an example, on the back of my great-grandfather Ellis Keller's card, from Lebanon County, Pennsylvania, is stamped 37-5-18. Then there's a space and a capital A. The first number represented the state, 37 for Pennsylvania. The second number, 5, was the district board number. And the last number, 18, was the local board number. The letter could be A, B, or C, and this corresponded to either the first, second, or third draft registrations. Now you should next contact the National Archives branch in Moreau, Georgia, which is near Atlanta, where the original cards are held. Once your ancestor registered, they needed to be classified and assigned a draft status. This would include classification lists and docket books 
of those persons registered. In addition, in Archives 2 in College Park, Maryland, and other regional branches, they hold records of physicals, questionnaires, lists of men who were examined, deserters, delinquents. These men might be referred to also as slackers, those that didn't register at all, even though they were ordered by law. And, of course, men who reported for duty, and maybe men who appealed to the president to have their draft status changed. All of these are located in Record Group 163. Now, for the period of World War II, the draft process was greatly expanded with far more registrants, and the cataloging of those cards was placed into seven separate classification groups for all males between 18 and 65. Like the previous draft, the upper left-hand corner included the serial number, with the order number on the upper right side being completed with the same process. On October 29th of 1940, Secretary of War Henry Stimson drew numbers from a bowl representing the first registration for those men between 21 and 36 years of age. The first number drawn for World War II was number 158, with hundreds of men across the United States who were again given order number one. Now, to aid genealogists to help them figure out which of those seven registration cards their ancestor filled out, there were letters that were placed in front of the serial numbers of five of the seven registrations. The second registration had preceded with it the letter S. The third was preceded by a T. The fourth, or old man's draft, was preceded by the letter U. The fifth preceded by an N. And lastly, the sixth had preceded with it the letter W. Only the first and the seventh were not lettered. On the back of the card is stamped the local board, the number and location where the registrant went to fill out the forms. Cataloged nearly the same way as they were in the previous war with the state, the district number, and the local board, the National Archives in College Park, Maryland has a master list of all the draft registration board numbers and locations alphabetically by state and territory. For World War II, you should also contact the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri to obtain copies of the draft classification list for this war and the dockets to determine the status of your ancestor. Once this is done, then contact the archives in College Park, Maryland and obtain the other Selective Service records that I've mentioned for World War I. They're very much the same. All of these records are located in a different record group, Record Group 147. See the show notes for complete details and examples for each of these drafts and the documents associated with each. Join me next month when we will break down a wonderful underused source of civilian registration cards during World War I. These cards targeted women during the war and were part of the Women's Committee of the Council for National Defense that recorded the history of women on the home front from 1917 and 1918. Until next time. In this genealogy gem, I want to let you know about a little known feature of one of my favorite products. As you know, I recommend Backblaze for super easy computer cloud backup of all your files on your computer, which of course is really important since that includes all your genealogy research. Well, just the other day, one of my listeners, George G, alerted me to an article. Now, it's called Ode to Locate My Computer because he thought it was such a great feature of Backblaze. And the feature, of course, is locate my computer. Now, I haven't talked about this feature on the show, so I thought I would invite the author of that article, Yev Poussin, uh, who just happens to be the director of marketing over at Backblaze, to the show to tell us more about it. Hi, Yev. Hi, thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. We, we've seen each other so many times at the Roots Tech Conference in Salt Lake City, and mm-hmm. that's certainly where I came to know Backblaze and I'd love to have you start us off with just kind of what's your elevator speech in case somebody is listening who isn't familiar with cloud backup, and this is kind of a foreign idea. 
What is cloud backup in a nutshell? Yeah, so Backblaze uh, is a cloud backup service. And what we do is essentially take a copy of the data that's on your computer, we encrypt it, and we store it safely somewhere off-site. In this case, it's in our cloud. And that allows customers to log into our website and see the data that they have backed up with us, even download the data to a different computer, just one file or all their files if they have a complete system failure and they need everything back. Um, And we can even send them a hard drive with all of their data on it. So it's really a copy of your data somewhere else in case something happens to your copy of it. Exactly. And, you know, after doing this show for 11 years, I've been through several computers, sometimes changing out of, you know, being forced into it because a computer crashed or broke. And then other times where I just wanted to do an upgrade. And it's so convenient, but it's also it's also a huge peace of mind to know that all that family history and genealogy research that I have done all of these years is is safe and that it's not only stored on my computer, but it's stored on your computer, your servers. And Mm -hmm. um, that makes a really big difference. And you guys also have an app, too, right? So people can access their files on the website, but also on the app. Yeah, that's right. So we have uh, iOS apps and Android apps. And so what those apps allow you to do is uh, log into your Backblaze account and scroll through the files you have backed up with us. And if you need to get one or a couple of those files to your phone for whatever reason, you can do that from within the app. It's pretty great. Yeah. Now that's a feature that I love. Um, So this feature that George loves that he was so excited about, it's called Locate Mm -hmm. My Computer. So why is this so cool? Yeah, it's, it's actually one of my favorite features that does not get talked about so much, which is uh, why I started that blog post off by saying some things don't get the credit they deserve. <laughs> um, and so one of our engineers, Billy, uh, and I kind of designed this Locate My Computer uh, feature. And it came out of, this was really Billy's brainchild, but it, but it came out of customers asking us, uh, hey, you know where I'm backing up my data from because you're on my computer, my computer was stolen. Can you tell me where it's located right now? And our answer was always no. You know, we, we know the IP address that you're connecting to Backblaze through, but we don't have the exact address for it. Only the internet service provider that provides that IP address knows that. But we would, you know, we would say, hey, if you have, uh, if you are working with law enforcement, have them contact us and we'll give them that IP address and they can try to, you know, try to get that information out of the Internet service provider. And this would happen, you know, fairly frequently, uh, not like an everyday occurrence or anything like that. But every few um, weeks, we would get a person that wrote in with this request. And so we kind of thought about it and we decided that having a feature built in that would show you a general location of your computer. Now, we don't show the exact location because we don't want vigilantes, but we show you a general area of where your computer is along with where the last known IP address that it signed in from was. And that is usually enough information for law enforcement to go in and try to retrieve that computer if they so choose to do so. And so we built this little feature and it's, uh, you know, you can turn it off if you don't like it, but most folks just leave it on. And it allows people to kind of map out a general area of where their computer is. And we use Wi-Fi access points to kind of triangulate a general uh, location. And then we display the IP address as well. So we've had folks that now they don't, they no longer need to contact us. They just go to that feature page and and show that to law enforcement. And then the, uh, you know, the authorities can, can go in and, find the exact address of where that computer is pinging home from, and then that allows them to recover the computer, where we allow the customer to recover the data. So while the data is still with us and the customer can have it, uh, the computer itself is sometimes pretty valuable. And so this feature allows, uh, in some cases, for authorities to get that uh, property back. Wow, that is fantastic. I remember a couple of years ago, one of my listeners wrote in and she said that many things were stolen from her house along with her computer. And that would have made a big difference. I mean, she, I remember her telling me how relieved she was that she had just heard the show and she had put back Blaze on her computer. So she knew she had her data, but boy, this is just kind of the next step. Yeah, it's, a, it, you know, and, and not everyone uses it or realizes that we have it, which is one of the reasons I wrote that post as well. Just kind of like a, hey, you know, this does exist in case you need it. 
Um, but in, 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 in most cases, folks don't need to use this feature, which is kind of nice. Uh, but it is there just in case. And we've had some really entertaining stories of people using it to get the computers back. Oh, I know. You were sharing some of those in the post. You got to tell the listeners what some of these stories were. Yeah, so um, just to, I'll, in the post, I kind of link off to to a bunch of these blog posts that we've written as they've come in throughout the years. But some of our favorite ones are the there was a a case in Argentina, and in Argentina, what happened was a user, and we'll call him Joe because there was litigation around this. Um, but but Joe was traveling to Argentina and got his computer stolen. And when he came back to the United States, he was like, oh, you know, I have Backblaze so I can get my data back. And this was uh, one of those stories from before when this feature launched. But he wrote in and was like, hey, can you tell me where where the computer is? Uh, and we said, yeah, here's, you know, here's your ISP address. And he was able to work with the Argentinian authorities to have them go to the ISP and they were able to find the physical location of the computer. And when they went to go retrieve the computer, they not only found Joe's computer, but a bunch of other computers and over a million dollars in counterfeit currency because it was like it was like some mafia smuggling ring uh, that they ended up busting Whoa. completely randomly. Oh, my gosh. You guys are really out there, you know, saving the world. <laughs> With yeah, this. That's pretty was- cool. Yeah, it was definitely, it was one of the more wild stories and, and they wrote about it in the Argentinian newspapers. And so Joe was able to send us a couple, um, a couple articles where, where they go into, you know, like this weird online backup company was able to, you know, help recover a million dollars in counterfeit currency. And we're like, well, we just played a small part, but yeah, I suppose so. And then there was, there was a great, um, there was another story, Una, she was traveling across the world. She was on the like a, a cross country flight and had her computer stolen. I believe it was in Turkey. Um, she, you know, she set down her laptop bag and you know when she went to go get it, it didn't have the computer inside of it anymore. And she was able to use this feature to kind of follow her computer across six different countries, and eventually, a year later, was able to retrieve it in Australia. Uh, and she was, I believe, uh, somewhere in the in the UK. Wow, her, so her it, computer like, it, became a world traveler. And she it could did. Really it watch went, it. Yeah, yeah. So she was in Dublin, and then she left the computer on a plane in Turkey, and then found it in Thailand, and then from there it went to Bali, and then uh, it went to East Timor, and then it went to. I believe Australia and then ended up being recovered in Australia in Queensland and then sent back to her. Wow. It was, that one was a wild, wild story and it took forever. That was a really long blog post, but a really cool uh, method of getting her computer back. And she was really committed too. most people I think would give up, but she really wanted it. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can always replace the computer. Really. It's the data, isn't it? It's the data that's yeah. just irreplaceable. And that's what you guys really specialize in. And you mentioned an IP address. And I just want to make sure that everybody listening knows that when sometimes we think of the computer as having its own address, but really, it's the internet provider that you're accessing through that you're using to access the internet on that computer, right? Uh, that's right. That's exactly right. Okay, so that's why you can if a person steals your computer, go takes it to their home and starts signing in and looking at stuff online, they're really sending a signal from their location and their mm-hmm. internet provider. And that's what it is. Well, it so matters. do people have to turn this feature on? And is there a way to opt out if you do not want to have Backblaze yeah. aware where your computer is? Yeah, definitely. You don't have to turn it on. It's on by default. But every uh, every account uh, for Backblaze online backup, if you log into Backblaze, you can say, no, I don't want this computer tracked. And you can do that per computer, I believe. Awesome. Well, great stories. And it really is a very cool feature. And just one more way that Backblaze kind of helps protect us. And and in our cases, all of our precious genealogy stuff, that's that's what we care about. So thank you so much for all you guys do. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Profile America, Monday, February 11th. Among his very many achievements, Benjamin Franklin played a leading role in the founding of America's first hospital, 
decades before the Declaration of Independence. Together with Dr. Thomas Bond, he obtained a charter for a hospital to serve the poor, sick, and insane in Philadelphia. The Pennsylvania Hospital opened on this date in 1752 in a converted house. The hospital later developed at a location where a modern medical complex still serves the city. During its long history, the hospital's doctors have made advances in many fields, becoming known as the father of both American psychiatry and of surgery. Today, there are 7,100 hospitals nationwide, employing over 5.8 million people in the $877 billion per year business of healing. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau, online at census.gov. Thank you so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode 226. Hey, we, we packed a lot into this episode. Thank you so much to all of my guests. And um, do stay in touch with us through the Genealogy Gems newsletter. Uh, That is the way each week on Thursdays that we get all the latest news out to you. Um, My upcoming events will be Roots Tech. I will be at Roots Tech 2019. We'll have a big booth right up front uh, in the exhibit hall. I'll be teaching two different classes. One of them is brand spanking new. And I'll even be doing a couple of demos. I'll be doing a demo in the demo area in the exhibit hall. I'm also going to be doing a brand new little session that's called DNA Basics in Plain English. If you've ever just felt like you've attended a DNA class and you're like, I'm afraid to to lift my hand because I I don't want to ask a stupid question, but I'm not totally getting this. That is what we are going to do in this little session. They're going to have a special DNA area where we can do shorter sessions like this. And um, I'm just going to give it to everybody in nice, straight, plain English. Answer their questions so that they really understand what's happening and be able to go into class and participate. So lots happening at Roots Tech that I'm really looking forward to. And of course, the behind the scenes with me and with Genealogy Gems is over on Instagram. Uh, Instagram, if you search for Lisa Louise Cook or Genealogy Gems, follow me there. We are having fun. I have posted some very kind of really fun things lately. I talked about my birthday I posted a story about finding a tombstone. It was hilarious. <laughs> I love all the comments everybody was leaving. So Instagram just provides a really fun place to kind of share the stuff that just doesn't really fit anywhere else. But lots of uh, fun ideas over there and behind the scenes. And of course, our Facebook page at Genealogy Gems Podcast. We love staying in touch with you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. I know we're all busy, but I love meeting with you here on the podcast. I'll meet with you next month. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.